Peter Thomas Fornital. Happy to be with you in the Brooklyn Bunker once again, working with our friends at Twin Spires, working with our friends at Betting on Content, and extremely happy to be joined by the co-host of so many shows for me on our own In the Money Media Network and all of these Let Loose shows so far. You know him from his national TV appearances and for his uh, famously sharp opinion, even if it leans a little bit towards the lower end of the odd spectrum. I'm talking about the people's champion coming to us from the planet Texas, Jonathan Kinchin. JK, what's up? PTF, yeah, last time we did Let Loose, it feels like uh, we had a lot more going on. It was at Saratoga. It was in the middle. It was this weird first Saturday in September. It feels like the world is trending right back in the direction that uh, we'll see me attending my 13th consecutive with an asterisk next to it uh, derby because I didn't go last year, but I don't think last year counts for anybody. <laughs> no, it was a weird year. I mean, it was an, certainly a, an interesting race that proved a key line of form, and it was great to get a Kentucky Derby to help us through a trying year. But how great is it to be pointed back to the first Saturday in May? We are here today to talk about this all stakes, all graded stakes, pick four from fairgrounds on Saturday. Before we do that, I do want to talk a little bit more about our friends and partners over at Twin Spires. Of course, we've got the 100-point Kentucky Derby and Oaks uh, races this weekend from the fairgrounds. Those are two of those graded stakes we'll be talking about. We've also got a fun offer to mention. Twin Spires has a great opportunity. What I love about this is it's not just for new customers. It's for existing account holders as well. The Louisiana Derby Day bet back promotion. You get your bet back if your horse runs second in any race Saturday from the fairgrounds. That's right. In every single race, a chance to get your $10 win back, uh, win bet back if your selection runs second or third in any race. The bet back only applies to third place if you've got a field of eight or more runners. It's a top two, five or fewer runners, which just makes sense. Uh, five or, yeah, which just makes sense. But it's a cool promotion, good opportunity to take advantage of. And I, go, I love the idea that uh, everybody can get involved, but you do have to opt in. Make sure to go to the offers page on twinspires.com and do that to get this chance to be handed uh, extra free money. Extra free money, something, JK, I know you're typically very interested in. What are you looking forward to seeing the most without you know giving it all away? Because we'll go through these four stakes races, but what are you looking forward to the most on this card? Yeah, I think the rematch between Claire Air and, and, and Travel Column is obviously exciting. Exciting. And then, you know, it, it, as these distances start to grow for these Kentucky Derby preps, the excitement grows even more. And I'm looking forward to Mandelown showing back up and hopefully showing uh, what he showed us last time and continuing to progress forward. There's a couple of new shooters in there, too. And it's not even preak this week. And I'm already saying new shooters. <laughs> I think you're allowed. I don't think you have to put a dollar in the jar because you're coming to the new shooter term so early in the year. But sounds like for you, as with me, as exciting as all these races are, and in truth, the single horse I'm looking forward most to seeing, I won't tip my hand just yet, isn't a three-year-old, but this certainly has these major implications on the three-year-old trail. We'll get to those, but why don't we start off with our first topic, JK, and it's an analysis of the New Orleans Classic, this grade two race. We've got the second and third place finishers, Captivating Moon and Chess Chief, returning in this year's edition. We've also got the return to the races of Roadster. No silver wig, however, for Roadster this time around. Bob Baffert, no longer his conditioner in the excellent uh, hands of Mike Stidham now. Or, JK, you could make an argument uh, that I'm tempted to make that this race is as simple as using the Brad Cox trainee signed on in this spot, Owendale. Um, Owendale, who I feel like has the strong late pace and will not be far back, I don't think, in this group. What do you think about this year's New Orleans? Well, it's it's interesting to notice that uh, Maxfield doesn't show up here. And, and considering the fact that Maxfield won the mine shaft, which is a prep for this race, uh, it's kind of wide open now. The other thing I think you'll notice when you look at this race is there's not a lot of speed in here. So you can try to look for a horse that can take advantage on the front end or you can look for a horse that has that big closing kick. We talk about it all the time, you know, these races and these horses on the front end inviting the closers into the race. I don't see a horse in here that can take advantage of their speed. If they make the lead, I feel like they'll by default be inviting the closers in and I'll take the best closer in the race. And for me, that's the two Owendale. Owendale's the type of horse that 
In these grade one type races, I'm always going to be fading him. But in the grade two, grade three type races with the right setup, I believe that he can win. I just don't think he's quite that top tier. And so I, I think he does have a chance in here off the performance last time. He's got an excuse to continue to improve as a five-year-old. And I think Owen Dale is the one that you want in here as that closer. Now, someone could get out on the front end and take advantage of it. Maybe a horse like Roadster will be ridden a little bit differently, but in Roadster's last five or six starts he didn't make the lead for Bob Baffert I don't think he's going to make the lead for Michael Stidham so that's the hardest part of this race is trying to identify who's going to be on the front end the other horse that I thought was at least interesting based on time form us was the six chess chief who they thought could end up on the front end and I respect those speed figures enough to know that if they project this horse could get there uh, he's the one that I'm going to be using as well trying to find out who's going to take advantage of a paceless race I think you used the right phrase about a closer being invited into the race. I think that's exactly what's going to happen with Owendale. And if you take a look at those time form U.S. Uh, pace projections, yes, Chess Chief is clear. But Owendale, with his massive closing kick, only figures to be a couple of lengths back, if that, at the pace call. If he's in that kind of striking position when the real running starts here, it's going to be awfully hard for him to be denied. Let's pause on Roadster for one more second, JK. Just looking at the raw dope, looking at the figures. This is a horse who fits in this spot. Interesting notion. He might be ridden differently. Comes here off a 378-day layoff. Sounds like you're more interested in watching than using in this spot. Am I reading you correctly? Yeah, you know, look, um, I, I think it's fair to say what we've seen in the last few weeks and what I think we'll continue to see is it's 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 barely not even an argument anymore that Bob Baffert's the best dirt trainer uh, in the country, if not all time. And for whatever reason, uh, if Bob Baffert found a way to get Roadster beat six times in a row, no offense to Michael Stidham, but I, I just don't see a reason as to why this horse is going to make some big jump up on an improvement. And he's a name that people will remember running in the Kentucky Derby. He's going to take money. Uh, it's one of those deals where these horses that end up on this Derby trail later in their career, people remember them and they continue to bet them. And I, I think Roadster is one of those horses that will get bet a little bit. And, and I'm going to try to beat him. Our friend Chris Felica over at ESPN talks a lot about the concept of public teams when it comes to sports betting. He also says there's such a thing as public horses. And I think you're right that Roadster may qualify for like a baby version of being a public horse. Let's move on though, JK, to our second topic. Uh, we're going to move on to race number 12. It's the Muniz Memorial Classic, grade two on the turf, mile and an eighth. I have a strong opinion in here. And that strong opinion is that Colonel Liam is really really good. This is a horse who, when you just look at the regular form, absolutely fits and looks good, but maybe doesn't look like he has that much in hand over the competition. But when you look at this race through the lens of closing sectionals and see how this horse finishes, I think that's where his true superiority in terms of ability comes into the play. He's a horse I'm very much looking forward to pressing in this pick four uh, sequence. You've said many times that you and I in a horse suit, if we were trained by Mike Maker, would have an opportunity to make an impact, at least at the grade three level, um, if we were going long on the turf. Maker's got two in here. Are you going to lean with your tried and true maker angle? Do you think I might be on to something with Colonel Liam? Who's your pick in race 12? Well, the horse suit thing is going to go down to whether I'm in the front or the back. Um, it, and I'll let the audience decide who's going to be, who's, who's more powerful uh, towards the rear. Um, you know, I felt like last time was the time to try to get cute and beat Colonel Liam. First time facing older. Uh, there was also the situation that there wasn't going to be run with Lasix. The number wasn't that uh, that dominant in the field. If you're going to try to beat Colonel Liam, last time was the time. I don't think this is the time. The Mike Maker thing is more long on the grass. When I say long, I'm talking mile and a quarter, mile and a half, mile and three eighths. Those types of races that Mike Maker's horses typically show up in. Colonel Liam just looks like he's probably the best turf horse in the country. And I think he proved that in the Pegasus. He even proved it a couple times last summer as a three-year-old with some really impressive races. But 
I think we wanted to see how he turned out as a four-year-old, and he turned out to be a pretty darn good one. I think he'll be extremely tough to beat in here. Um, if anyone's going to beat him, it's going to be a tactical race-ridden type of situation. And for me, that's the one factor this down towards the inside with Brad Cox. This horse is forward, like many Brad Cox horses are. We'll get out there on the front end. He's drawn to the inside. He's going to save ground. And, and I think that he could be dangerous if, for whatever reason, Colonel Liam runs into traffic. But if you give Colonel Liam, that big, beautiful gray horse, uh, a good trip, he'll win this race. You and I are very much on the same page. I like your idea. Factor this as a backup. And I'll compliment you. That was a very artful way of comparing me to a horse's behind, JK. And I, I don't know. That's really no night. Not a very nice way to uh, speak to an Irishman or a half Irishman anyway on St. Patrick's Day. Where's your green, by the way? Well, the first thing is there's only one of us is the New York Times bestselling author. Well, let you, I'll let everyone else guess who that is. Um, well, I don't have green, but I'm not Irish, obviously. Well, not obviously, I guess, but most likely. But I, I can probably do some of these lights here to make it a little bit more festive. Did you did I switch see. to green? Let's huh? see. There We're we go. Oh, yeah, there it is. I All see right. it in the reflection right. of the pictures. That's There we go. You're, 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 everybody's Irish today, JK, for, uh, for St. Patrick's Day. Did you see that we had... Uh, Six Irish winners out of seven races at the Cheltenham Festival this morning. Un unbelievable, unbelievable showing for the Irish side. All right, enough about that. Let's move on to the aforementioned Oaks and Derby preps. We'll start off with the Oaks race. Uh, the third race we're going to talk about is the Fairground Oaks grade two. This is the Twinspires.com Fairground Oaks, I should say. Definitely got a name check, uh, name check the sponsor there. Uh, we've got travel column versus Clarier. That's how this race is being billed. If you look at the future markets, you look at that future book for the Kentucky Oaks that uh, that uh, Churchill ran the other week, you had Clarier 7 to 2 favorite, Travel Column 6 to 1 in the second spot. But the more I looked at this race, the more I thought that there might be some other interesting ways to go. We'll just start with you. How do you see it? Do you think we could see a big turn up in the prospective futures market for this race? after it is run uh, race number 13, the fairground Oaks on Saturday. Yeah. I mean, I was pretty clear on the record uh, how I felt about the Rachel Alexandra and the ride that Floron gave uh, travel column compared to the ride that Claire air got. I, th I thought Floron should have gone on with travel column rather than doing that whole save, save, save thing. And the problem is, is that I liked travel column on that day I liked Clarier moving forward. So I'm a little bit in a pickle because I, 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 I want to be right about Travel Column's ride last time, but I also want to be right about Clarier's ability to continue to be to, to mature and to improve and that she's probably the one you want moving forward. So it's very hard for me to separate the two of those because I have two reasons to latch on to each of them. I, I am going to go with the trip. I'm going to go with travel column. I think she'll be more aggressively ridden this time. I have an, I have a, a, sus, a suspicion that Floron will, will, will be a little bit more engaged earlier in, 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 in the lane or in the turn and kind of get her rolling a little bit. Um, but those two seem to stick out a little bit uh, to me in, in terms of who I think is the most likely. And, and I guess if I was looking for something creative outside the box, it would be for the four little Tootsie trained by Tom Amos to, to maybe look back to that sprint number that she had two races back. Maybe Tom learned something about her. The, the uh, upgrade, uh, forgive me, in, in, in Ryder to Louis Saez, maybe something different from her could get her to the winner's circle with all of that speed if the other two happen to be back there messing around. I'm contrarian in this spot. I, I think the right move from a value point of view, and depending on what pool you're in and how much you're playing, I'm not going to quibble with anybody who wants to use Claire Air and travel column. I think you did a great job describing the dilemma, the, the overall development angle versus the specifics of the trip angle between those two. I have trouble separating them. But the fact of the matter is, is that effort, doesn't give them that much in hand over a number of today's rivals. I think you mentioned one of the key ones, and that's uh, and that's Little Tootsie, who makes an awful lot of sense. That was a very impressive race last time. Granted, it's in the slop, so a little bit of a different ball game here. But she might have been on what yeah, maybe wasn't the best part of the track down there on the inside. She also was, I think, against the flow. Those were some pretty early, uh, slow early fractions that she ended up closing into. She just looks like one to me who should move forward, shouldn't be too far back in this spot either. This is another race that doesn't exactly have 
blazing speed signed on. And then the other one who I think is interesting in a very similar regard is number five, obligatory. This runner, just two starts, Judmont pedigree, Bill Mott, two things that make me think obligatory could improve with a racing. Nice looking run against the flow last time as well, and a chance to, uh, to potentially go better here. So I'm going to look in my picks uh, mainly to press the four and the five, and I may save with the two obvious ones as well. Any other thoughts on this year's Fairground Oaks? Yeah, I mean, just my prediction is obligatory is going to be overbet in here. Um, she's the 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 most likely alternative. She is a uh, trained by a public trainer, right? We talked about the public teams, and I think Bill Mott would be categorized as a as a, uh, a public trainer, a Hall of Famer uh, who can get good horses and keep good horses and win big races. I think people will look to that horse as an alternative. And I think honestly, we'll probably be over bet compared to the actual chances of beating the two favorites in here. Uh, I, I'm going to probably just use those two, but I'm going to press t- uh, travel column and try to get, uh, and try to try to pick up the pieces that I missed last time. The Rachel Alexandra. It's a theory based on not much other than intuition, but I could totally see what you're saying happening, playing out in the wind pool. And I could see a little bit of that value. You know, we don't have morning line prices as of this, uh, as of this Wednesday afternoon recording. So we'll, we'll see uh, what those are, because that can affect this too. But I wonder if maybe a little bit of that value with obligatory could be preserved in a bet like this all stakes pick four. We will find out on Saturday. It all concludes with race number 14. It's the grade two Louisiana Derby. Very, very interesting running of this race, the twinspires.com, Louisiana Derby, I should say. Um, we've got Mandelown. You tipped your ha- hand a little bit, but, you know, it ain't going to be easy. you got the likes of Midnight Bourbon and Proxy in here as well. JK, who's going to win this year's Louisiana Derby? Well, I mean, I think the conversation obviously starts with Mandelown. Um, didn't run great in the Lecompte but didn't run horribly came back adding the blinkers and showed a kind of grindy stay with you type of style lost ground on both turns and just kept going. He feels like the type of horse that's going to appreciate added distance. I love the idea that he's that kind of grindy blinker type. Remember this edition and last year's edition of uh, the Louisiana Derby, a mile and three sixteenths, the longest prep race leading into the Kentucky Derby. Um, so I-, I think that Mandelown is going to be extremely tough based on his style, how he responded to the blinkers and the speed figures that he ran in his last couple of starts. The one horse that I think is interesting that I will be using as an A-type in multi-race bets is the five Hot Rod Charlie. I remember when I first started to kind of fall in love with the Kentucky Derby and the Derby Trail, there was a couple of horses that showed up throughout that time. Nyquist and I'll Have Another, both trained by Doug O'Neill. And luckily during Derby Week, you get all of these stories and these anecdotes about the trainers and about their careers And one of the things that I picked up and I remembered hearing is that Doug O'Neill trains his horses a little bit differently than some people do. He's got very intense gallops. Some might call it a two minute lick. And I think that translates very well to getting horses to stretch out. The longer the distances, they'll just gallop around there. And if you think about Nyquist and you think about I'll have another, not big turn of foot types, but when the other ones were stopping, they were still rolling. And I feel like Hot Rod Charlie's the type of horse that could end up looking like that. You'll look at the form. If you're not familiar, you'll see Leandro Moro is named as the trainer. That's just because of a suspension uh, that uh, Doug O'Neill is, is serving right now. So he's in his assistant's name, longtime assistant, basically the same thing. I think Hot Rod Charlie's going to run much better than the odds, and he'll be my alternative. But Mandelon, I think, is the most likely winner. You talk about the potential for stamina helping Hot Rod Charlie, and I think it's there's two pieces to it. One, quite simply, the distance, this race being at the mile and 316 but as opposed to the paceless races, we, a couple of paceless races anyway, we've been talking about during this show, this race appears to have absolutely plenty of gas. That could bring stamina into play, and as a reason why I definitely do respect Hot Rod Charlie in the spot. Horses that, you know, he's gotten good setups the last two times, And there's some part of me that wants to downgrade him for those, but I don't think that's right in this spot because of all the reasons JK said. And I, Oh, you go ahead. And I also think it's important to know that hot rod. Charlie's got a little, he's got a little umph in that pedigree. He's a half to Matoli and not that Matoli was some, you know, dominant animal going long, but if you can win the Met mile, the way that he did, and you could be a champion sprinter the way that he was, there's obviously some pedigree in there that suggests that that uh, that could be passed on, that brilliance could be passed on to your siblings as well. 
I'm so wishy-washy in this race, JK, but you know, I love to come on podcasts, especially and give a pick like, this is what I want to do. And I can't do it with as much confidence in this race because really depending on final odds, I could see going a whole number of different ways for the record. I think from here, while I respect hot rod, Charlie and Mandelown, I might make my top pick number four proxy in this spot. Who's a horse who I just feel like you can make a case. Every single race has been better than the last being by Tappet out of a strong female family. I think there's reasons why Proxy can keep getting better. He doesn't have to improve that much to get past uh, the best of this crew. And I think he could get a terrific trip of more of the stalk and pounce than closing variety, still taking advantage of that fast gallop in front of him and maybe finishing past the tiring speed and ahead of the closers. Do you give Proxy any count? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, he's the type of horse that, that I, I've made some uh, exact type plays. And he's a logical horse that I'm using uh, around the other two that I like in this spot. He, he's, a, he's a horse you have to consider. Uh, he's a horse that absolutely can win, but he doesn't really get the blood flowing for me in terms of uh, like I really have an edge with him. I feel like the price that he's going to go off at is probably the chances he has of winning. And he's just kind of just a down the middle of the road type of horse. The other horse that I thought was interesting is a three run classic. Um, this is a, a son of run happy. And there's a couple of things about that. Obviously on the, the Fox shows, I, I hear the commercials often, but it's a good reminder that, that run happy ran drug free, no Lasix and uh, run classic is going to be making that switch from Lasix off uh, for the first time. And, and it gives me a little bit of confidence that that won't be an issue for him because uh, you know, daddy did it and daddy ran a lot of fast races. And if daddy could pull it off, there's a good chance that whatever it is that, that, that makes that happen, uh, could get pa- could get passed down. The other thing I'll say about Run Classic is th- is that he feels like the type of horse that's going to continue to get better and better and better as the distance get longer, and that's based on basically that Run Happy was struggling uh, early in his career as a sire because all of his horses were running short. Uh, when that clock and that calendar flipped over to January and these three-year-olds started going a little bit longer, Run Happy actually started winning a lot of races as a stallion. And it seems like the added distance is what's what is what's helped those guys. I mean, I understand that he was a sprinter, but you know, Gary Stevens, who rode uh, Run Happy, he's always said he always thought the horse would go longer. Uh, but just there's some mental things that kind of got in his way that prevented him from doing that. So um, I, I think Run Classics another good alternative in this spot. I'd love to have some run classic on my tickets as well. And I'm glad you mentioned him. And yeah, you can identify that over the years. It pays some big dividends to figure out who the sires are, who are going to get better with time and with distance. It does seem like run happy falls into that category and run classic is an interesting, yet another interesting contender in here. Again, a race I really want to be able to see the board and, and shop around before getting fully stuck in. But I think we've covered the principles and the ones that I'd want on my pick four tickets. Anyway, we're going to come back to you, JK for your best bet of the day. Uh, in just a moment, but I want to just remind folks about this Twinspires.com promotion. Great opportunity, not just for new customers, but existing ones as well. It's a bet back promotion. If your horse runs second in any race Saturday, and even if the horse runs third, if there are eight or more runners signed on, this is for the first 10 bucks you bet. Great way to get a little bit of insurance on your plays. You have to opt in. That's one thing I will mention. The Louisiana Derby bet back offer. Do it uh, on the Twin Spires app or via twinspires.com. You don't get this unless you opt in. So make sure to do so. JK, let's talk about your uh, best bet of the day. This could be a horse you'd want to exercise that uh, get the, the bet back option on, or it could just be a horse you're looking to key around in your various picks. If you could just pick one of the ones we talked about, who would it be? Well, you know, look, I, I think the one for me is definitely going to be uh, uh, Colonel Liam. I just think that he towers over that field. I think he's going to win a lot of big races this year, grade one races. Um, at this moment, he's the most talented and the best turf horse we have in this country. He'll be a short price, though. Another horse that I'm going to give you is, is, is actually we didn't talk about this race, but it's race 10 at Fairgrounds. And I really like the six Temple City Terror. This is a horse that I've been kind of following throughout the career. Um, showed up at Churchill one day, had a big race that day, and I just kept following. I liked this horse last time, and, and to be honest, I needed this horse 
last time in the Albert stall. And I couldn't overcome the fact that Al stall jr. Was running an Al star seniors race and the Lika trained by Al star stall jr. Wired that field and temple city Terra was trying to come was running on late. And I think this is the race that I want temple city Terra to kind of get a little bit of revenge. I think she'll be a nice price on the board as well. So that'll be my best bet from the races we talked about Colonel Liam. I like that you mentioned that because it does start a pick five, actually, an all stakes pick five with the four races we talked about. And then uh, you can kick things off there with Temple City Terror and JK. I'm with you. Colonel Liam is the one for me. If I just had to pick one horse to key my day around, Colonel Liam would be the one. Folks, we're going to be back for the next several weeks. Lots of Triple Crown prep action. We're going to have it all covered for you here on Let Loose. If you want to uh, ask us questions, be in touch. Follow us on Twitter. JK is at UT Big Hair. I am at Looms Boldly. Looking forward to being back with you next week. Take advantage of that Twinspires.com Louisiana Derby Day bet back offer. And may you win all your photos. <laughs>